The Hardy-Weinberg equation is a mathematical model that was developed by G.H. Hardy. That is Hardy. He's a British uh, mathematician. And uh, Wilhelm Weinberg, this gentleman on the right, he is a German uh, physician. They both lived and worked in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, they didn't work together, but they independently uh, converged on the same ideas to describe um, what we now call the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium principle um, that we use in study of population genetics. So we're going to take a little bit of a deeper look at the derivation of the Hardy-Weinberg equation and how it is used um, in population genetics. There are a few key ideas we should review before we look more closely at the Hardy-Weinberg equation. First of all, that's just looking at um, population genetics as a field of study. That is the field of biology that studies how selective forces can lead to changes in allele frequencies in the gene pool of a population. So we'll break down that definition and make sure that we're all clear on how these things work together um, in studying the evolution of populations. So as you may recall from previous information, an allele is a variant of a gene um, that is found at a particular locus on a chromosome, and different alleles can produce different phenotypes. So just to review those terms, um, that, that gene variant is a different version of the same gene. So in our example, we're going to be using eye color. So we're going to assume that an allele for brown uh, eye color produces brown eyes, an allele for blue eye color produces blue eyes and we'll take it from there. Um, a locus is just the location on a chromosome where you find a particular gene that codes for a particular trait. And um, as you may recall, the difference between genotype and phenotype, a genotype is the uh, combination of alleles that an organism possesses, and the phenotype is the outward expression of those alleles or the outward expression of the genotype. The gene pool of a population um, is defined as the sum of all the alleles in a population. So we're going to assume uh, our organisms in this population are diploid, so two copies of each um, chromosome, meaning two alleles, two variants of, for each gene, one from the maternal parent and one from the paternal parent. So if you have a population, for example, of 100 individuals, you are looking at 200 alleles for each gene um, in those individuals. So if you take all of the alleles for all of the genes in all of the individuals within a population and put them into one big sort of mixing bowl, you've got the gene pool of that population. Uh, allele frequency, recall, refers to the rate at which a specific allele appears within a population. So how frequently how often do you see that version of a gene relative to the total number of all the alleles for that gene? So we're going to express allele frequency as a fraction or as a percentage or as a ratio. So for example, if you have one quarter of all the alleles in the population um, are one particular variant, you may also say 25% of that population um, of that gene pool is one particular allele, you may also see it expressed as um, a decimal like so. Allele frequencies will always add up to 100%. So remember, we're talking about the gene pool. We're talking about all of the alleles in uh, the genome or the genotypes of a population. And so allele frequencies must always add up to a sum. They must sum up to the whole. So an increase in one allele must mean a de decrease in another allele. So if selection acts on a particular trait and increases the frequency of that allele in the population, um, by default, the other allele or the alternate, the alternate allele will decrease in frequency in the population. And that is what population geneticists look at when um, looking at how populations evolve over time and looking at the types of selective forces that can influence those allele frequencies or changes in those allele frequencies. So looking at things like a competition 
um, predation pressure and, and other types of selective forces like that. So the principle of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium um, states that a population's allele and genotype frequencies are inherently stable, meaning that in the absence of evolutionary forces or selective forces acting on that population, that those allele frequencies will remain the same from one generation to the next. In order for a population to be considered in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, those evolutionary forces that must be absent include things like um, selective pressures, so no competition for resources, no competition for uh, habitat, no predation pressure, those types of selective pressures that we know are always um, going to be present in natural populations. You also have to assume for, for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium with stable allele frequencies, no mutations. So there are no new um, traits being introduced into the population or into the gene pool of the population through uh, mutations. You also have to assume no migrations, so no gene flow, no movement of alleles between populations um, of organisms. You also have to assume random mating, which means that no individual has any advantage in finding a mate or um, successfully reproducing over any other individual in a population. And you also have to assume a large population size in order for um, that population to remain in equilibrium. These, as we know, are very unrealistic expectations to find in any natural population. So it is incredibly unlikely to find any real population that satisfies all of these conditions and remains in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for any significant length of time. So why is the Hardy-Weinberg equation useful? Um, well, when you're looking at the way that you expect allele frequencies to um, turn out from one generation to the next, you can use the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equation to predict those allele frequencies and to solve for questions about phenotype based on genotype. And the inverse is also true, so you can look at questions of um, genotype if you already know the phenotype. So you can make predictions of what you would expect in the absence of these uh, evolutionary forces. Now, when you look at the numbers and when you look at the allele frequencies that you find in the population in actuality, you can compare what you observe in nature um, with what you would expect based on calculations using the Hardy-Weinberg equation. And the difference between observed and expected values can be used to make um, inferences about the strength and maybe even the types of selective pressures that are at work on that population. So it gives you an idea of um, sort of a starting point to look for, for bigger questions or more specific questions about the types of selection that are acting on um, a population at a given point in time. In addition, you can also use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to um, estimate percentages of the population that may carry a particular allele. For example, if you know that there is a recessive allele that um, causes a particular genetic uh, disease, then you can, if you know how many individuals in a population have that genetic disease or disorder, then you can use the Hardy-Weinberg equation to estimate the number of individuals who may be carriers um, or heterozygotes uh, for that particular disease. So there are lots of applications for using the Hardy-Weinberg equation, um, even though we don't expect to see real populations that remain in equilibrium from generation to generation. In order to start applying the Hardy-Weinberg equation to population genetics questions, it's helpful to see where the equation came from in the first place or how it's derived. So we'll take a quick look at that. Um, we're talking about P as the frequency of the dominant allele and Q as the frequency of the recessive allele. 
So remember, P plus Q always has to equal 1 because we're talking about percentage or frequency of alleles in the gene pool of our population. In order to take it to the next step, we're going to use allele frequencies to start predicting genotype frequencies. Remember the genotype is um, the collection of alleles that an organism has at a particular locus. So in this case, a diploid individual is gonna have two alleles for the trait in question. So if you have two dominant alleles or your genotype is PP, then you would be considered homozygous dominant for that trait. If you have two alleles and they're both recessive or your genotype is QQ, that would be considered homozygous recessive for that trait. And thirdly, if you have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, that is where you get your heterozygotes or individuals who are heterozygous for that trait. So let's look at how we figure that out using the equation. So in order to get to genotypes here, uh, from allele frequencies here, we have to imagine uh, a mating event, right? A reproductive event. So let's just look at that as one individual from this population with these allele frequencies crossed with another individual from the same population with those same gene frequencies. So we are doing a multiplication. We are squaring um, P plus Q. And since P plus Q equals 1, we'll square the other side as well and one squared, as we know, is one. So if we do a little bit of algebra, we get P squared, P times P is P squared, plus P times Q, plus Q times P, plus Q times Q. And that's gonna equal one. So this gives us P squared plus, these are the same, P times Q and Q times P are the same thing. So you get two PQ, plus Q squared equals one. And that is our Hardy-Weinberg equation. So that is where it comes from algebraically. If we bring it back to genotypes, now we can see that P squared is the same thing as P times P why does that look familiar? Well, that's from up here, right? So P times P or P squared is your homozygous dominant um, genotype. So P squared becomes the frequency of your homozygous dominant genotype. P squared, frequency of homozygous dominant. Where does the Q squared come from? Well, remember that was QQ from up here. So that is the frequency of your homozygous recessive genotype. And 2PQ becomes the PQ from up here. That is now the frequency of your heterozygous genotype. Now let's see if we can translate those mathematical scribbles into um, a more clear example of how Hardy-Weinberg equations are derived. So we're gonna go fishing for eyeballs. We are, um, I should mention, oversimplifying the concept of how genetics control your eye color. So eye color is actually a polygenic trait, which means that it is a trait that is controlled by multiple genes. There are multiple uh, genetic codes that cause different things to happen that 
contribute to what color your eyes are. So we are grossly oversimplifying the idea that one allele is responsible for eye color, but for the, for the sake of example, that's what we're going with. So we're going fishing for eyeballs in our gene pool. So this represents the gene pool of our um, population and each one of our eyeballs, blue or brown, represents a single allele for um, that eye color. We're going to assume that for our example, that brown eye color is the dominant allele. So we're gonna use uh, P to express the frequency of the brown allele. And we're going to assume that blue is recessive. So Q is going to represent the frequency of the blue allele. So the first thing we'll look at is our population that consists of 200 individuals. So if we have 200 individuals, how many alleles for eye color do we have in this population? Well, that's gonna be 400 alleles because each individual is a diploid, so each individual has two alleles. And this is the breakdown of the genotype frequencies of our population. So 25% of the population has the homozygous dominant genotype for eye color, and 50% of the population is heterozygous at the locus for eye color, and 25% of the population is homozygous recessive uh, for eye color. So how do those genotypes translate into allele frequencies within the gene pool? So if you have 25% of the population of 200 individuals, that's 50 individuals, so 50 people, uh, 50 diploid people have 100 alleles for eye color, um, so that is 100 dominant alleles from that portion of the population that is homozygous dominant. So you've got 100 dominant alleles here. For the 50% of the population that is heterozygous for eye color, you've got 50% of 200 individuals, which gives you 100 people. 100 diploid people is 200 alleles. So out of that 200 alleles, um, half of those alleles are going to be the dominant and half of those alleles are going to be recessive. So you get another 100 dominant alleles and, another, and uh, your first 100 recessive alleles from the 50% of the population that are heterozygous for the trait of eye color. If we take our, our last 25% of the population that are homozygous recessive for eye color, you've got 25% of 200 individuals, which gives you 50 people, but 50 diploid people have 100 alleles. Both of their alleles are recessive, um, so you get another 100 recessive alleles here. For a total of 100 dominant plus 100 dominant plus 100 recessive plus 100 recessive, we get a total of 400 alleles in our gene pool. Now we can take all of these alleles, each allele represented by an individual eyeball, place all those eyeballs into our gene pool, and go fishing for genotypes. So we have a gene pool full of eyeballs. 50% uh, of those alleles are dominant, um, or P, and 50% of those alleles are recessive, or Q. So we're going to rely on a little bit of background knowledge of probability and start working on the chances um, of each genotype being um, selected for at random um, in, during a fertilization event between two individuals from this gene pool. All right, so remember our brown um, eye color allele is the dominant allele, so we're representing the brown allele with the P. So what are the chances, if you dip into this gene pool, that you uh, draw a brown allele? Well, we're going to represent that with the frequency of the brown allele, which is simply P. Because remember, P plus Q equals one. One is 100% of the alleles in the gene pool. P is the frequency um, that you see the dominant allele in that gene pool. So the chances, if you reach into that gene pool and pull out one allele, um, the chances of that allele being a P is represented by the frequency, which is essentially P. So then what are the chances that you dip in a second time and pull out another brown allele? Well, that's going to be P again, because the frequency of P in the gene pool is P frequency of the brown allele is P. So P times P gives you what? There's your P squared. So we have the um, probability 
of this individual having the homozygous dominant genotype um, within this population. So let's look at the next possibility. So there's also a possibility that you get a brown allele and then you get a blue allele. So the chances of drawing a, a brown allele from this gene pool are going to be represented by P and the chances that you then draw a blue are going to be represented by Q. So that gives you your first PQ, which remember is the heterozygous uh, genotype for eye color. However, there is a second possibility or a second way to achieve the heterozygous genotype, and that is to get a blue allele followed by a brown allele. So that would be getting a Q followed by a P, which again is going to be QP, which is the same thing as PQ. So another uh, way to get a heterozygote. And then finally, we figure out the probability of the recessive uh, genotype by looking at the chances of drawing a single blue allele, which is going to be Q, followed by another blue allele, meaning you get um, two recessive alleles, one from each of your parents. The probability of that happening is going to be Q times Q or Q squared, which remember is the frequency of our recessive genotype in this population. So that is how we end up with our Hardy-Weinberg equation, P squared being the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype, 2PQ being the frequency of the heterozygous genotype, and Q squared being the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. And when we know um, how to use this equation, we can use it to figure out um, genotypes, phenotypes, and answer all types of questions and make all types of predictions about populations and the forces that are at work in shaping the allele frequencies in that population.